I think we can get started. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, this is our monthly virtual justice event uh, with the Center for Social Justice. And tonight's topic is Martin Luther King Jr. The message in today's world. I'm your host, I'm Paula Farmer. I'm a Glide church member, lay leader and congregational life leader and also a director of community belonging at the Berkeley School. I will be um, interviewing today a, a, a panel, but before we introduce our panelists, I'd like to get this conversation um, started with uh, Eric, who will read our land acknowledgement. Eric Arguello. Thank you, Paula. As we always do before every event, we acknowledge that we are on the unseceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone have never seceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as peoples. Thank you, Eric. Um, I was thinking um, maybe we should introduce our panelists before we move into our video. So um, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Holly Joshi, who is the director, of, um, director for the Center for Social Justice here at Glide. Dr. Joshi joins Glide as a new director and she is a Bay Area native and has been a community servant and leader in social justice and systems change work for 20 years. She has worked on issues of racial and gender justice, youth and community development, and criminal justice reform through executive leadership positions with government, nonprofit, and private social impact organizations. Dr. Joshi is a nationally recognized expert on gender-based gender violence, prevention and intervention, and served as an executive director for MISI, a direct service organization providing crisis intervention, long-term supports, and advocacy for trafficked youth. She served on then Attorney General Kamala Harris's Task Force on Human Trafficking and Task Force on 21 Century uh, 21st century policing and has worked to implement survivor centered policy reform and legislation at the local and state level. Before coming to Glide, she worked as the Director of Racial Justice and Systems Change at the Bright Research Group, which is a woman of color owned, operated research and design firm. Um, Holly holds a BA in criminal justice, a master's degree in leadership for social justice, and a doctorate in educational leadership. Her work has been featured in Bay Area local press on MSNBC, Anderson Cooper, and in Essence Magazine. Away from work, she enjoys spending time with her partner, kids, and French Bulldog, taking in spicy foods and the beauty of the Bay, which includes hiking, biking, and running. She is thrilled to join the Glide team and honored to work with so many powerful, brilliant people committed to justice, healing, and love. What a resume. And that's not even the resume. That's just the, the highlights. Welcome, Dr. Holly Joshi. And do we have, um, has Dr. Cheryl Evans Davis? No, she has not showed up yet. She is on her way. So I'll just let you know who she is so that when she gets in, she can just slide on in. She is the executive director for the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. Cheryl Evans Davis is a change maker who leads relationship-driven, community-centered initiatives. Named executive director of the San Francisco Human Rights Commission in 2016, Davis is a passionate advocate for equity, access, access and educational opportunities for all. 
For nearly three decades, she has made contributions as an educator and leader with expertise in community outreach and engagement, workforce development, youth development, and violence prevention. Dr. Davis worked to build out an equity framework with San Francisco community stakeholders and city departments resulting in the Office of Racial Equity. She also oversees the Equity Studies Task Force, the Blue Ribbon Panel for Juvenile Justice Reform, and the Dreamkeeper Initiative, among other programs of the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. Davis is frequently requested to speak on issues of com community wellness, equity, strategic change work, and she holds a BA from San Francisco State, an MPA from University of San Francisco, and an EdD from UC Rozier. In 2019, she was awarded an honorary doctorate from UC, um, U University of San Francisco. And I can attest to the fact that she is also a preacher speaker because she has been uh, coming to speak with us at Glide and it has been a joy. So once she gets here, we will give her a hearty welcome. I um, also wanna keep in thoughts and prayers, um, our third panelist, Sandra uh, Haggerty, who is out with uh, laryngitis. So she will not be joining us today, but we are holding her here in this space as well. So Eric, while we're queuing up, can we start with the video? And I'd just like to give us um, a framework to um, start our discussion around. Absolutely. I think you are mute, so it's not, there's no sound. be a part of change and see the words that are associated with America like liberty, justice, and freedom be true for all people. isn't a crime. It's a free word without bondage. I have a dream that our relationship preference wouldn't hinder us from our aspirations. I have a dream that learning about LGBTQ plus isn't a talk of uncomfortability in our schools. I have a dream that the ignorant choose facts and education as their way of defense rather than violence. I have a dream that Blacks and people of color can feel and know 
that they are just as equal as to anyone else. I have a dream that HBCUs are advertised like a new pair of tennis shoes. I have a dream that in schools around the world, we can form one another. We can inform one another of our successes, backgrounds without being judged. I have a dream that I can go to sleep at night knowing that I am indeed gaining the same opportunities as others. I have a dream that black lives won't be undermined nor discarded like an unwanted gum wrapper. I have a dream that I made it this far because of my drive, determination, and consistency, and not because someone felt forced to include me as a prop because of the color of my skin. And Dr. Davis has joined us. Welcome, Dr. Davis. We already went over your introduction. We're excited to have you here with um, uh, Holly Joshi. And uh, we, we've um, so far just showed the video of a student who is discussing what her dream is. And so I wanna go ahead and get us started. Um, what exactly are we celebrating today? And I'll start with you, Holly, so um, Dr. Davis can get settled in. Sure. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Hi, Dr. Davis. What an honor to be on this panel with you. Um, thank you, Paula. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Hannah. First and foremost, we are celebrating our capacity to be here together in multiracial coalition as we are today. And part of the reason we're able to do that is because of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So we're here celebrating the life and the legacy of a world leader and an American hero. We are celebrating the contributions of a justice warrior who valued all human life, who lived through, recognized, and boldly called out injustices, but who also, as Barack Obama said, had the audacity of hope. We are celebrating a man and a movement that articulated with words and modeled with actions the alternative. He understood and took on the charge of dismantling oppressive laws, policies, and practices. He knew we had to tear down structures, but he also knew the criticality of the building he engaged the building of the alternative ways of thinking, being, and doing with great enthusiasm, nonviolence in the face of horrific acts of violence, and ongoing human rights abuse and terror. He and they modeled the alternative. He said, not burn, baby, burn, but build, baby, build. They didn't just talk about it. They lived it. And so today I'm really excited for us to have a conversation and to think and reflect about how are we living the messages. I love the way you worded the question, Paula. You know, what are we celebrating and the ways in which you worded the invitation around let's discuss the messages. How are we living the philosophies? How are we enacting every single day and, on, and in all the ways, the unconditional love, the radical inclusion, because the living it creates the beloved community that he talked about. So that's what I'm celebrating today. So thanks y'all for being here to celebrate that with me. Thank you, Holly. Shell Evans Davis, what are you celebrating today? Um, so grateful for you all and sorry for my tardiness. Great to be in conversation with um, with you, Holly, and to be in this space, very inspired by those opening words. You know, I've really gone back and forth over um, over the what is it that we're celebrating? And I think, you know, first and foremost, people are celebrating the life and the person that was Dr. King. But when we really begin to unpack and what I really start to think about, um, I had a conversation with some folks uh, earlier in the month and 
was drawn to this idea of um, the creativity and the collaboration of Dr. King, right? In the sense of, you know, he was moving through the space um, as a clergyman, right? That was called to do some work. And even by the, the you know, just before he, he was murdered, like he was really calling people, right? To change, to question, to challenge. And I think that that push for folks to kind of consider, right? So I think that that's the, you know, my, my things have been these three seeds around like consider, create, and collaborate, right? Like that we are really celebrating this ability to, um, to consider, like to consider the potential for change, to consider your role in the, the work and the, the effort to change, to consider how things can be better or can be different. Like that's one of the things that I felt like you really called us to, but I always go back to um, just the, the notion of creativity, his ability to really take spoken word, right? Whether you think of it as a sermon or whether you think of it as a talk, but his ability to use spoken word, to use speech, to draw people in, um, to be creative in that way um, and, and to also be collaborative, right? Like he could have been really focused on just the spotlight. He could have just been focused on the fact that he had gained recognition. He was the leader of this movement. <laughs> but when we think about the March on Washington, right? They talk about the, the group of folks, right? They talk about the numbers, the big eight or the six, like they talk about these people who all played a role and he collaborated across the board at a time. Like, I don't think people realize like the significance of A. Philip Randolph and the Pullman and the Pullman's, the, the group of folks who were like doing this labor work and that were union folks and someone like um, Bayard Rustin who was a gay man at a time when that was not okay, but to be centered and to have a space and to place and to have the ability to collaborate with folks across the board or even to include John Lewis in that March on Washington as a youngster that didn't necessarily have to be front and center. Like he really, we celebrate just him being so truly ahead of his time and giving us the the markers of like how to advance this work even in a time when people um stay people are starting to feel hopeless right people start to lose hope and so i think that um those are the things that i really celebrate just his consideration his creativity his spirit of um collaboration but that he was willing in all of these things like he was willing to stay hopeful. He did not lose hope in that. Um, he continued to believe in the dream. He continued to push it. He continued to talk about it. And I think that when we uh, think about that, we celebrate that correct courage that ultimately he demonstrated for us. And hopefully in that celebration, some of it falls on us, right? Like it, it helps us think that um, with a little bit of courage and a little bit of consideration, we can collaborate and create a new space. Thank you. So in thinking about Martin Luther King Jr., most people highlight the I have a dream speech. That tends to be the one that is stuck, has stuck. And Martin Luther King Jr. gave over 2,500 public speeches during his lifetime that have been documented. And many of them were improvised. They were, they were notes on a piece of paper. Uh, we hear in, in the um, if you look at the entire recording of the original speech, um, I think it was Mahalia Jackson over on the side going, tell him about the dream, Martin, tell him about the dream. And he just kind of riffed on a sermon that he had given. And um, I think that was at a kitchen table, as a matter of fact, when he was talking about that. But at this particular, I have a dream speech was given in front of an audience of 250,000 people uh, in a hot summer day in 1963. and it was a march for freedom and jobs, which I think often gets lost in the discussion. How do you think that message fits in today's world with everything we're experiencing with um, recession, with workplace um, violence, layoffs, all of those things that, that tie into where we are in this market 
Um, that coupled with the um, the resonant the resonating um, idea that we are somehow going to overcome this. Where are we now with this message? I mean, I, I'll I'll start out by saying I think it's interesting, um, you know, that that speech that he. Um, has become synonymous with the I have a dream speech, right? Like that's, you know, people say I have a dream speech and they mean Dr. King. And what's interesting is that he picked that phrase up and that cadence and that thought up from um, a minister by the name of Prathia Hall that he, um, but he asked her permission. He heard her do this, like repeating that phrase over and over again, I have a dream, I have a dream, and asked her if he could use that, right? And so again, I think when you talk about like where we are in, in space today compared to then, I think he, even then he was like, I don't care that a woman was leading this, like this is a powerful tool, it's a powerful thought. And he brought that to bear. And I think that there are a lot of people who argue that between his pushback on the Vietnam War and his push for economic justice is ultimately what had him killed, is that his push to really challenge the status quo um, and to challenge that uh, idea and notion that only focusing on one group was going to be able to resolve it, but understanding, you know, he was launching the Poor People's Campaign, something that Reverend Barber is starting to bring back. He understood at that point in time that um, sticking to one thing and focusing solely on race was not going to get us to where we needed to go because economic justice is really the crux of it and that that is a tool um, for continuing discrimination, disparity, and bias. And so I think that that uh, in so many ways is, you know, it represents where we are today, right, that we are still fighting the same battle that basically he gave his life for, that towards the end of his life, he was really doing this, this pivot to say like, we've got to focus on economic justice, economic rights, because um, it doesn't matter where we sit on the bus if we can't afford to get on the bus, right? So I think that those were very important pieces that he was trying to, to bring about. Yeah, that, that resonates, Dr. Davis. And I, I just, I mean, I can't agree more that we are facing the same issues of racism and poverty and capitalism and militarization. Um, and in many ways, the disparities are growing. And Black people, as a people, are still suffering under the weight of historic and systemic oppression. I was in a meeting yesterday, and you know, I'm new to work in San Francisco. The, the large body of my 22 years of work has been done in Oakland and Alameda County. So I'm getting up to speed on all of the San Francisco stats and everything that's happening in San Francisco. And someone said, the black population in San Francisco is now down to 5%. 37% of those struggling with homelessness though are black and 50% of the jail population in San Francisco is black. So we were talking about that last night at Glide planning for a pilgrimage that we're getting ready to take to Alabama, Selma, Montgomery, Birmingham in March to immerse, our, immerse ourselves in the story of black pain and power. And so we're meeting and someone said, slavery didn't end, it's just evolved multiple times. And I just thought, absolutely, absolutely. What did it evolve to? The Black Codes, Jim Crow, the war on drugs, mass incarceration, and now here we are with the war on poverty and mental health. And we are the most punitive society, yet no one feels safe, and we're one of the most violent, developed nations. But what worries me is that we don't seem to be learning from our past mistakes. We don't even seem to want to follow the data and the research that exists that shows that this practice of mass incarceration does not work. And in fact, it has torn through the fiber of Black communities after everything else that we've been through. Um, and Dr. King talked about the freeing of the slaves not really being freedom. 
And so at a time when we were trying to rebuild without the 40 acres and a mule, without any economic investments, um, without any land um, opportunities, right? At the time when we were making progress and attempting to rebuild from nothing really besides our resiliency in our community, um, the mass incarceration and the war on, on drugs happened. And we started locking up everyone in prison and prison recidivism rates speak for themselves. Um, it, it, it just doesn't work, right? People come out and, and go back. We're not rehabilitating. We're not um, supporting anyone to get uh, to where they need to be. So we could, you know, Michelle Alexander wrote a whole book on this and there's more and we could talk about that part of it all night, but in the spirit of Dr. King, we have to root in and ground in and investigate the building of the alternatives. And there are people working on this all over the country and definitely in the Bay Area. There's restorative justice models based on indigenous approaches to community accountability and healing. Uh, there's the community alternative response models to crises. And at Glide, we've been deeply participating in the coalition work happening in San Francisco with our partner organizations to interrupt the police's practice of pretext stops, which really are stops for minor non-dangerous traffic infractions like air fresheners dangling, which have been shown through research um, to be used across the country. This is not unique to San Francisco, but to racially profile uh, black folks. So, Part of this work is direct action work. It, it is the direct action, the protests, the organizing, the demanding for policy change. And then the other part of it is the disrupting of existing narratives about who black and brown people are and dismantling the narrative of criminality because we know it's a falsehood. And we've been here before to Dr. Davis's point about how Dr. Martin Luther King used creativity and spoken word to move social change, right? That was the recognition that the narrative work is just as important as the direct action work because the stopping, the stopping and searching and, and the racial profiling is being driven by the false narrative that black people are criminals, right? But when we look at the data, it shows very clearly that the recovery rate for contraband drugs or guns or anything for black people is low in comparison to white folks. Really like the, the recovery rates for contraband when white people are searched is higher, yet we continue to racially profile, stop and detain black people. So Dr. King's message of positive regard of the deservingness of dignity for all and, and, and justice as public love are resonant and absolutely necessary today. Thank you. I also want to invite you, the audience, to go ahead. If you have any questions that are coming up as we're going through and just having this discussion, please feel free to put them in the chat if you feel like you will forget them. There uh, will be some time to ask questions uh, as we get a little bit closer to the um, towards the end. So feel free to go ahead and populate right now. So I want to move on to um, ask how specifically for you, you both are working in um, areas that continue the civil rights work on many different fronts. How um, has Dr. King's message or even the, the message of the civil rights movement in general, how has it impacted your life and the work that you do? Can you hear me? Yes. I was gonna have Holly go first. Oh, Holly, you can go first, please. Sure. We're both trying to be too polite. So this question, I, I thought about it and it, it was actually a really difficult question because it was like, let me count the ways, right? Um, it's just really so deep and there's just so many numerous ways that it would be difficult for me to articulate all of the ways. So I'll talk about just a few and I'll start with my upbringing. And I was raised in, you know, a Southern Pentecostal church with a grandfather who was a black pastor of a church in Oakland. 
And so Dr. King's roots in the Southern Black church and position as a minister um, really informed my understanding of the critical role that spiritual leaders in congregation must, can, and must play um, in the work of social justice. It also very much, like I said, growing up in the Black church in Oakland during the war on drugs in the 1980s, when so many things were happening all around me to my community, um, it really helped me to develop a critique of what I, I saw happening at, at my church, right? Because there was the Dr. King alternative and there was, um, there was the Dr. King framework. And then there was what I was seeing, which was, yes, we were, we were preaching and we were doing personal transformation work with people and we were healing souls and we were teaching the word of God, but there was a very clear distinction between the church and the community's political activity that was happening all over Oakland. Um, and so at a very young age, I believed that we had that moral obligation that Dr. King spoke about, um, that we couldn't just be a, a house of worship and we couldn't just be an ideological school, but that we should be involved in and sometimes should be leading efforts to impact change in our communities. Um, so, you know, that's one of the reasons I was so excited to join the team at Glide was because of that deep work that Glide has done historically as a spiritual place that understands that we must be rooted in spirituality and the rec but the recognition that justice work is a moral obligation for all of us. Um, so that work from the intersections of spirituality, personal transformation, direct service to community and political activity is what Glide lives every day. And I'm only two weeks in, but really excited to be here. And it feels like full circle from, you know, my, my youth and um, the critiques that I developed at that young age based on the framework that Dr. King had provided. Um, the other thing I'll say is that, um, you know, similar to what Dr. Davis was highlighting around his collaboration and his commitment to bringing other people to the front as well, is that that framework of servant leadership provided me a model as I stepped into leadership. Um, his consistent focus on the most marginalized, you know, he said he called folks the least among us. That has been my daily struggle and daily commitment. And, um, you know, Dr. King had a certain amount of access. You know, he had a PhD. He'd been to the ivory tower and survived. Um, he, but he understood and continued to warn us about the token integration as not being our goal, right? And so as a person that has light skin privilege and education privilege and, and access and positional authority, I think that model of servant leadership and recognition that my positionality and my place and my token representation does not represent the goal of freedom. And that until the least among us that are continuously struggling under the weight of oppression have the same access that I have, then our work is not done. Dr. Davis? Yeah, I mean, I think um, just really moved by those comments. And I think, you know, it's funny because you talk about a level of access and I was, um, talking with a group of students today and we were really looking at a letter from a Birmingham jail, right? And trying to unpack that and understand that there was a tremendous amount of privilege in that, in that whole space in the way that it, it played out, right? For Dr. King to consciously make a decision that he was gonna be arrested, right? And so how many folks um, can afford to be arrested, to not worry about losing pay, to not worry about their reputation, to not worry about how it's going to impact them. And then in this letter that he's writing to the white clergy, the white clergy men, right? Like he's talking about, he doesn't typically respond to these comments because, you know, he, if he did, his secretaries would be all busy all day uh, responding, not him, but that these 
other folks. So the access, the privilege, the power that's represented in that, and that we're fortunate that he didn't abuse the power, right? That he um, used it as the, the old folks used to say to me, use the power for good, right? Lose your power for good. Like when you get it, don't, don't abuse it. And so for me, I'm originally from, I was born um, in a little town in Texas. Uh, my mother, you know, she went to segregated schools, right? Like we experienced and, and went through those things in that way. So I think that there is a, um, there is a tremendous amount of um, privilege that exists. Um, and even for ourselves, like I have to recognize I, you know, I make probably more in a year than my little grandmother made in her 20 years of working, right? Like, and I understand cost of living is different and uh, all of those things, but that, to your point, Dr. King went to Morehouse College when he was 15, right? So his parents had supported him. He had graduated high school early. He went to seminary. He had a, a PhD from Boston College, like, and a fellowship. So all of these things, for me, are representative of, like, what we can accomplish, but that we don't leave people behind, right? We don't forget people. Um, and my stepfather was a pastor in West Oakland and spent so many um, days like having that reinforcement of, you know, I say to people all the time that there's a difference between the idea and notion of religion and the idea and notion of spirituality, right? Like, and there is, there are studies that talk about um, spirituality is important for a sense of belonging and so, um, well-being. Spirituality, the sense of feeling like you belong and are a part of something, is important for peace and for making good decisions. And so I think in so many ways, for me on a personal level, he represented um, so many different things that we hope will be passed down, that we hope will be passed on. and. Um, and that people won't lose sight and say that was a different space and place and time. And, you know, and he, cause he, he had the same struggles, right? If not more than what we maybe have now and still was able to leverage power and access and not, um, not leave other people behind. So that's my, my initial kind of like what it means to me on so many different levels as a, as a Southern girl who, you know, even though Jim Crow and segregation was, abolished formally, right? It, by the time I, by the time I was born and living, it still exists. I would argue in some places it still exists, right? Like we still, and, and folks don't, I would say even in the San Francisco Bay area, it still exists, right? That people are still, there are still certain places that I know to be really mindful of myself when I go into. There are still certain stores that when I walk into them, people are like watching me, like, why are you in here? You don't belong in here. But like there are still these experiences that exist and that history um, really offers me hope to be able to, um, to move through some challenging times. I hear that, Dr. Evans. So um, many states are moving towards removing African-American history from the history books. Um, they're moving uh, books from the library that have to do, um, that are written by African-American authors. We know that Octavia Butler and Toni Morrison, many, many of the greats are being removed. And then also uh, an attempt right now to remove African-American uh, history from the APs. What impact do you think this will have on us as a nation and how will people be able to continue to celebrate this legacy? What impact will it have there, do you think? Well, I will say I've just been, I was just talking to my, um, um, my sister who teaches in Texas and, you know, even just small things. Like I was trying to give her a book about Fannie Lou Hamer. And she's like, I can't, can't have that book because you know, she was at, you know, she was a voting rights activist and like that could potentially get me in trouble at the school. And there are so many things to unpack here. And one of the things that ultimately for me, education represents is power, right? Knowledge is power. And so when folks tell these narratives about 
system. Black folks don't want to learn or they don't want to be educated. Like it's so contrary to the culture and to the, the actual history. People were literally lynched and burned and, you know, eyes poked out for learning how to read. Right? Like it was, there were anti-literacy laws. And I feel like these shifts to take away AP, African-American history or to ban books is because it is powerful. The fear that folks have about people learning about their history or learning about experiences or being able to have um, these conversations um, is scary for some folks. And so they are trying to really do the same thing that was done during slavery, during Jim Crow, during um, segregation, like it is about silencing, erasing, and eliminating people. It's about not letting you know the truth or seeing different experiences because if you see something different, you expect something different. So the idea that slave owners had that they didn't want their slaves to read because they said they will start to think that the world is bigger than what they see here. And if I start to believe that I can achieve more, if I see people, that look like me that have done more, then I start to believe I can do that. And I won't just be subjected to your, your rules, your norms, because now I realize the world is bigger. So I, the biggest thing is we're inclined to go backwards because we're erasing the stories, the history, the, the hope of folks. And that's not just for black folks, that's for everybody. But those things are tools and strategies for success and it is meant to again control it is a tool of control that that's that's how I see. absolutely and dr joshi i think it's 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 quite interesting like uh when we were about to get into um or when we did go to um quarantine and everybody was was there to see everything that unfolded with the the trials that were going on with george floyd and Folks got into their books and all the libraries were sold out of certain books. And now we're in this state of fatigue. And now going back into, let's take all of this information away because it's too much and it makes me feel yucky. How do you address that, doctor? Yeah, but thanks for this question, Director Paula. I really am looking forward to hearing your response too, because I know you're working in various schools actively. And so to kind of hear from your perspective, you know, the impact that it would have particularly on students and our young people and our next generation of freedom fighters. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to hold my breath a little bit and wait because I know your answer is going to be good. Um, but um, yeah, I, I just, I, I can't, I can't imagine, I can't allow myself to go there. Um, because Dr. King, as we as we've kind of been hinting at around, you know, the creativity and wordsmithing and the spoken word and how much emphasis he put on this work, um, led those that that magic and that ability that he had and that focus on the spoken word literally helped to lead us to the Civil Rights Act um, and the Voting Rights Act because he understood the importance of narrative change work to social change. And now, you know, I, I've spent my master's and my doctorate time studying the, the, the frameworks that he gave us for what systems change looks like. And one of the most important leverage points for change that's always articulated now is around this conversation about narrative change. And there's an African proverb that sa says, until the lions get their own historians, the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunters, right? And so folks know that. Folks understand that. People, people know that politics are a battle for the soul of America and that the battles are fought through stories, that those who shape the story and the narrative define the issue, they define the solutions, they define the resource allocation, and so America trafficked and enslaved Africans and, and raped and pillaged from indigenous folks and uh, entrapped Japanese people, like everything that we've ever done that was a human rights abuse, the burning witches, women as witches, everything that we've done has always been supported by and deeply rooted in a false narrative about who those folks were. Right? It was always a narrative about how those folks were subhuman, 
that was foundational to the institution of slavery. And Dr. King understood the importance of interrupting and disrupting the narratives and positioning himself as the lion's historian. So for me, this new conversation, the burning and the, and the battles around the books is directly related to that. It's directly related to the stories of the civil rights movement that were told through sermons and speeches and the 2,500 you know, speeches that, that you, you talk to us about. Um, Paula, and through the interviews and through the images that were shown through the screen. So with all of this imagery and storytelling, he then was able to demand that America be true to her promissory notes. And he also redefined what it meant to be an American who believes in liberty and justice for all, and then issued the mandate that all Americans must be working daily actively on this goal, on this mandate of freedom. So, you know, he said to us that no matter how far she strays away from it, that this remains the mandate. So that remains our mandate, is, is that the narrative has to be told and continue to be pushed forward. I don't have the answer to what we do specifically about the laws, aside from what we know to do and what we've been taught over and over to do is find alternative ways to tell the story, to come together in collaboration and to take to the streets, to protest, to demand the change. But it, it is very dangerous territory that we're, we're entering into, right? And we've been here before. And so I just want to make sure that we're not sleeping through it. You know, Dr. King also warned us to not sleep through the revolution and told the story of, you know, Rip Van Winkle who slept through the revolution. And I think that's where the young people are getting the stay woke, right? But I mean, that's, that's really it, is that we can't sleep through what's happening. And remember, we've been here before. And I, I work with um, children as young as two and in my work at Glide up to in the 80s, right? So I have that, that broad span, but within schools, what I'm finding is that there is a, a movement of fear, uh, specifically around um, of, of teaching anti-hate, anti anti-racism, um, even the discussion around um, becoming a white anti-racist has become inflamed because as children come home and make gentle correction to their parents around their own behavior, that becomes a problem. And um, I think it also becomes this fear around how do I talk to my child around something I haven't even prepared myself for. And so um, watching folks in their journeys, I think one of the biggest things for me in my work is making sure that we bring everybody along. So with the folks who have been in the, um, the proverbial trenches and who are fatigued already from doing the work and picking, um, picking up the heavy load, it sometimes is a lot more difficult for them to wait for everyone else to catch up. You've been living as long as I have. Why is it that you do not know what is going on with redlining that's a new term for a lot of people, didn't know anything about that. Um, and, and then also with um, moving away from a, a colonist historical per perspective to look at history through different lenses cause, causes people fear because they realize they haven't learned everything and that the, the school system and um, the laws and everything have failed them. And so what do I fall back on if my um, institutional structure as I know it has failed me. So I think that's that's where um, a lot of this pushback is starting to come from. And then also the false narratives that are out there for people who are just trying to serve themselves and also to maintain um, the white patriarchal um, society that gives them all of the privileges, as you were saying, um, Dr. Davis, um, all the privileges that they benefit from that they don't care to share with the rest of, of, of the world around them. So. Um, that that is taking me into this idea of where do we stand now with the rise of anti-hate 
Um, you know, for the longest time, they tried to push it into black on black crime, but now we're seeing that um, the mental health, um, gun laws, all of these things are impacting how we take care of not only people who don't look like us, but then also taking care of our own communities. Um, what do you think the message um, can be to help impact the rise in anti-Asian, anti-Semitic, Black Lives Matter, all of the different facets of anti-hate that's happening around us today? You know, it's, um, I think that that is one, one of the things that we can really learn from Dr. King, whether it was his relationship with Mahatma Gandhi or whether it was his real commitment to um, learning about social justice movements that were beyond um, what he was already comfortable with and what he knew. Um, and just collaboration and partnership. I think if we do not begin to realize that it is a sickness, this, this hatred that we see and the way that it manifests and the way, to sh way that it showcases itself, um, you know, I was talking the other day, we were talking with a group of folks and we were going through this thing, you know, thinking about like the word respect. And if we were to use each letter of the word respect, um, you know, what would the words be and, and, and how would we really die, define that? And one of the first words that somebody came up with was respect is reciprocal. And we really had to unpack that. So are you you know, it's one of those things that's that old it's saying, people are like, you have to give respect to get respect and you have to, all of these things, but understanding that ultimately this respect that we are seeking may not come from other people, but how do we respect ourselves, right? It's reciprocal in the sense of how we give it back because sometimes people will not respect us, right? And it will cause us to come outside of ourselves to not be true to ourselves and that in disrespecting them because they disrespected us, we are ultimately disrespecting ourselves, right? And so how do we move through these spaces? How do we have these conversations about someone else's hatefulness? Like, I don't want them to control me. And so that's the old thing where we just go, like it's, it's more powerful to like actually do nonviolence, right? Like it takes more strength in some ways to not hit somebody back when they hit you. It takes more strength to not cuss out the person who cusses you out, or it takes more strength to show love, right? To meet hatred with love. And so part of this is like, how do we really build a beloved community, right? How do we focus on working with folks who want to be worked with and hoping that that love is contagious, that it does bubble up, that it does connect with other people. But I think we also feed the fire because we spend so much time giving attention to the hatefulness, right? And that we sometimes lose sight of the things that are happening and people don't realize there are other places to plug into. And so I think that that's why, again, with these book bans and um, what classes we have access to and what information we get, Dr. Joshi, I really appreciated your unpacking and the way that you shared that because it really is um, just this sense of knowledge, right? And awareness and understanding. And I think we've got to spend more time investing in that. We spend too much time trying to turn, um, trying to convince people to not be something that they might be. And we're missing the folks who are being called into that, right? Everybody's looking to belong somewhere. Everyone wants to feel a part of something. And if we spend more time talking about the bad, then folks will be drawn to that. And we're not highlighting and celebrating and building the other. So I think um, that idea of building is, is hard because it, it's that's the hard work. It's the hard work, but it's the hard work. And I think we've got to spend some time doing that, that building. Thank you for that. Dr. Joshi? Sorry, yeah, my mute was I'm stuck. That was powerful, Dr. Davis. And um, yeah, just this, this focus on um, the bad that you're, you're bringing up and um, it, it's making me, it's conjuring a story for me um, about divisiveness 
you know, because Director Polly, your your initial question to us was around anti-Asian hate, uh, the war on poverty and, and folks struggling with mental health and Black Lives Matter and kind of all of these issue areas that if we don't stop and, and really think and, and remember that they're all rooted in the same things, right? We can work in silos and work against each other and not work intersectionally. And one, one story um, around, you know, certain folks in positions of power, maintaining power by keeping our movement work in silos. I'll try to make it brief, but I was working at a social impact organization as the director of racial justice and systems change. And what we were working on in the East Bay was trying to partner with government entities and philanthropic organizations to use research evaluation and capacity building to uplift the voices of the most marginalized communities so that they could actually influence government change efforts and, and philanthropic dollar, dollar investments. Um, and so one of the things that we had done is we had gone into Oakland Unified School Districts to talk with black and brown girls about their experiences in Oakland Unified School Districts. Because you all may remember, this was right after Chris Chapman had had a lot of success with the Office of Male, African American Male Achievement, really turning around, um, you know, kind of school push out and suspension of black boys. But what the what the numbers were showing was that right after black boys, black girls were having the worst outcomes and experiences inside Oakland Unified School District, but there was no investment in them. So we were investigating this. We talked to the black girls and they were telling us about their experiences of push out, et cetera, in school. And we wrote this beautiful report. It had quotes and pictures uh, you know, of black girls and uh, recommendations. And we took it to um, an, uh, an elected official who will remain unnamed to try and pull this elected you know, into kind of our freedom work. And the first thing out of the elected official's mouth was that you're going to struggle with the newcomers with this report. Meaning that our push forward for resources to be devoted to black girls was gonna come up against the needs of the immigrant community in Oakland. Like we can't have that, you know, we can't have that. And the way that we make sure that together we push back against that is by remembering the intersections and the root causes of all of our issues. Um, and, and remembering that it, it's going to have to be work that considers that our people are living at the intersections of oppression, right? M many of our people are living multiple oppressed identities. They're black and gay, they're immigrant and women, they're disabled and homeless. So us working in these silos is not gonna create the most powerful change. These overlapping identities that people are living call for our struggles to be intersectional. And I think that Dr. King understood that early, right? That's why people were like, wait, I thought we were talking about racial justice and now we're talking about anti-war and, and demilitarization and the war on poverty. What are we talking about? Because he understood the intersections and that the root causes of all of these issues were connected. When I first started doing work with survivors of sex trafficking, um, most of the visible leaders in the gender-based violence movement at that time, 15 years ago, were white, very middle-class feminists who were carceral feminists, really, that their ideology around how to keep women and girls safe in this country was just about locking men and boys up with no other intervention points. Um, and they were really missing the racial and economic justice issues that were impacting survivor lives. Um, and so I, you know, was coming into the movement like, I don't know how we can be effective anti-trafficking advocates if we're not also saying, basically, right, that Black lives matter. Like, how are we not saying that the rights of immigrants matter? Because that was the reality for the folks and was causing and keeping them in uh, the underground economy and locking them into servitude. So my wish for all of us is 
for us to rediscover our passions and skills and work together to, to meet the collective needs of our people. Um, and that is, is difficult, you know, as Dr. David said, and David said, it's not easy, to, especially to work intersectionally and not in silos. Uh, but I spent a lot of my, my time um, as a researcher and as an investigator. And what that taught me is very deep listening skills. I actually get very nervous and need notes and things like that when it's my time to talk, but I'm a very comfortable listener. And I think that we all need to exercise that because we, you know, even justice leaders, we get very excited and motivated and we want to do the work and we want to race to the front of the line. Um, but in order to do the intersectional work that needs to be done, that complex understanding of how our people are living at the intersections is going to take us coming together and it's going to take diverse multiracial coalitions coming together. And when we do that, we have to make sure that we're not, you know, replicating um, the power structures and the oppression that we're trying to fight up against. And in my mind, in my opinion, that really is going to take listening and living in inquiry and not believing that because, you know, I've been fighting anti-trafficking and gender-based violence and because I'm a Black woman that I understand everything. It, it has to be um, humility, leading with humility and living in inquiry and, and really exercising our listening skills. If I could just, you know, I'm so moved by um, Dr. Joshi's points and, you know, this idea of oppression Olympics, right? And getting into like, who's worse off? Like, we've got to shift that. We really have to. And I think that part of that comes from owning and recognizing you know, like instead of talking about what we don't have, like what we do bring to the table and how we can support and what are the pieces that we can use to, to build up instead of spending so much time using to tear down and these layers upon layers around intersection, this understanding of, um, of, the, of the different oppressive identities and how that shows up and what that looks like and how afraid sometimes people are to even be their fullest self, right? And I was saying um, to someone earlier, just thinking about being trans is in and of itself a very challenging space and space thing to do and be in spaces, but then to add black and trans and potentially poor and living in the tenderloin and looking for a job and doing all of these things. And if we are not able to see the struggles and the humanity of other people, then we are not able to fully help or help ourselves, right? And I think that goes back to the philosophy of Dr. King. Like, if I don't realize the network of mutuality, if I don't understand that my healing and my success and my, my ability to thrive is connected to yours, then we're never gonna be able to do it. If I don't understand that when I hurt you, I hurt me. If I don't understand that when I help you, I help me, then we are gonna be in this constant kind of cyclical fight to try and get things better instead of really being able to build a staircase to the next level. So I just really appreciate this idea. And like people talk about it, but it is another tool and strategy to kind of keep the status quo. The more we are at odds with each other, the more we talk about how I'm more oppressed than you're oppressed and, you know, like how hard it is for me and you got it easier, the harder it is for us to actually have growth and improve and make the impact and the difference. So um, I just, I really appreciate it and thank you for, for highlighting. Thank you both. And um, I know you are prepared for this, but um, Dr. Joshi, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit with this question. Um, we have just seen the release of the initial report for reparations that has come out um, and recommendation of $5 million per um, person um, who fits the, the criteria. Um, I'm wondering, what do you think our forefathers in, in the civil rights movement would be thinking about this? And then um, even more specifically, Dr. Joshi, um, California is taking the lead on this right now with a few other um, cities who are doing um, their own investigations. But from a systems thinking perspective, how might we uh, push this out into other states to make it a reality of exploration? Uh, 
Well, I'm definitely looking forward to hearing Dr. Davis's answers and, and yours as well, um, Director Farmer. But what comes to mind first is that our civil rights heroes and, and Dr. King and Coretta Scott would be absolutely celebrating and joyous and shouting and playing tambourines for this, right? Um, and I think that this is the collusion of a lot of things, but again, going back to our, our conversation and kind of our uplifting of the leverage point for change that is narrative work is I would imagine that all of the folks that worked on this had to do deep investments in storytelling and narrative change um, around in, in, around the invisibleness of the Black blood and work and building of everything in this country that has happened because that's been completely erased and invisibilized for years, right? And so when this conversation was first happening, what I was hearing a lot was like, you know, the resistance around the American myth of handouts, right? Around the American bootstrap, it's very connected. The handouts, the government handouts and the bootstrap philosophies are very connected. And of course they're a myth. So that's what I was hearing when this conversation was first coming into my, my life and my consciousness was that people were feeling a lot of resistance around this being some type of a handout. Um, and so the amount of education and narrative change work and conversations and storytelling and being the lion's historian to, to tell the truth about our labor and how much that labor was worth and the, the, the cost of that labor and what um, holding back payment and access to the things that we earned. This is earned income, right? Um, the amount of work that had to have gone into that for this to even be a consideration uh, had to be absolutely tremendous. And so I just have so much respect and gratitude and want to jump up and down and shout and play the tambourine. So I'm imagining that that's actually what Dr. King and Coretta Scott are doing, you know, not what they would be doing, but what they are doing. Dr. Davis, you have been elbows deep into this work, if not deeper. Um, and um, I would love to hear what your thoughts are. And then also, I'm not sure if if, um, if you maybe want to give a, a brief overview of, of what just got released and how you got there. Yeah, I mean, it is, um, you know, the, the disdain and hate that has come out since that report was released from folks um, is unbelievable if I'm able to work backwards. I mean, I literally, I have a, on my desk, uh, in my office, a letter that came in from someone that says, I hope you effers um, overdose on your reparations. It's like, this is the kind of just like vitriol that is like coming at us. People calling and saying horrible things about like their, what they think about um, black people and, you know, and how they have relationship with these people and that, you know, we, we don't deserve it. And so all of these things like that folks have put themselves really in so many ways on the line to put this out there. And the fact that, you know, this document has way more than just that $5 million, which is meant to be, as Dr. Joshi said, an opportunity to repair the harm, to acknowledge the harm, to talk about the blood, sweat and tears and the lives that have been lost. And folks keep talking about like, get up off your butt and go to work. Like that's what you should do. And not realizing that people did that for decades. They, for centuries, they built the wealth of other people and never got to benefit from it. They got nothing. They got like ushered off the land and didn't even get, you know, a banana for the road. And so part of this is that piece, but the other piece is that you know, uh, it doesn't make any difference, right? Like if you give me money and the system is still the same, right? Like if I still am not able to live in certain neighborhoods or I have to be treated badly or if I can't um, buy a home or if I can't get an education, if I can't treat my children as fully human or you won't treat them as fully human, like 
that's why the systems pieces, the program pieces are also important, these investments, because if we continue to send our kids to certain schools, they will continue to not see and see hear themselves or feel themselves represented. They will not have the stories told. So part of what's happened over the last year plus is that the Reparations Advisory Committee has been meeting, they've been reviewing and doing looking at the harm, they've been thinking about uh, it within specific areas of economic rights, um, housing, um, policy, um, health and wellness, education. They've been thinking about like how the system has worked to create these disparities. And, you know, I've done, um, last year I was doing these readings that looked at like, you know, the history is Thomas Jefferson did not create, did not want education, did not want school systems for the sole purpose of, um, he created it for the elite at that point in time. Education systems were not created for women. They weren't created for people of color. They weren't created for poor people. Thomas Jefferson is quoted as saying, right, that um, maybe we can break a few people from the rubbish to go to college, but that basically we want people to just learn enough to be good citizens, right? Like they don't need, they need to learn how to clean our houses, clean our streets, um, but they don't need to learn everything because that's just a waste of resources. So there is documentation of how the system is set up to not support people of color, but specifically not black people. Um, San Francisco between um, uh, redevelopment agency and um, uh, urban renewal, folks were that there are still covenants today that say do not sell this house to Mongolians and to blacks and to other folks and that um, people's houses were taken that are now worth millions of dollars and they got nothing except told to get out. So they've gone through, they've looked at the harm, they've documented that and put together the report and the recommendations which will go before the board of supervisors. And I think the thing that is most hopeful for me because you know folks are like, well, what, what happens with this? Beyond anything, um, you know, Congressman Conyers decades ago introduced the, the HR 40 bill just to have a discussion about reparations. We can't, we could not get that passed to just have a discussion about reparations. People are like, why did you wait so long? For the same reason that it took forever to get uh, a lynching law, which still, you know, to, to say that we we're not gonna lynch people, right? Like this idea of reparations, we couldn't even, we can't, we don't even have a federal thing that says we can study it and think about it and explore it. And so I'm hoping from this San Francisco piece that other places begin to have the conversation that we mainstream it, that we begin to talk about the harm that was done and how the systems have come. Jim Crow was not about, segregation was not about separate but equal. It was about how do we continue? And I think Dr. Joshi said this in the beginning. How do we continue a slave state without slavery? That's what it's all been about. How do we make sure that people stay in their place? How do we continue to control people? How do we continue to make sure that they are subservient and that you know we continue to monopolize and have all the power. And so I'm just, I'm hopeful and I'm grateful for the, the folks on the committee. I'm grateful for the staff at the Human Rights Commission that have led that work. But I'm most hopeful about um, just being able to talk about it, right? Just being able to have the conversation um, and to begin to acknowledge uh, the harm that's been done and at least you know, hopeful that some change will come. Thank you for that. There's a, a lot of hope we have to have there. I have a, a question from an audience. Um, Bob wants to know, um, what role do you believe music and the arts can play in changing and disrupting the narratives that keep all of God's children racially segregated and living in fear of one another? And he would also love to know any suggestions you have for bringing our voices together. So I just, I have to say, and I know Paula knows this, but that I am all about the, the music and arts. I just, I don't think we do this without it. I often tell folks like, if we look at the greatest really leaders of the Underground Railroad and the folks who have done um, really social justice work, 
even just the movement of the freedom riders and the freedom fighters, they did it with music and song, right? Like it is a unifying body. There is something scientific and spiritual. Like even the sciences tell us, the studies have shown that music calms you. It helps your heart rate. It helps your mental state of mind. It puts you in this place of being able to kind of escape the, the harsh realities of life. And so slaves use music when they couldn't tell the story when they couldn't talk to each other, um, you know, that was the, the tool and the strategy that the folks used at sit-ins and protests and marches. Um, it is a common language, um, whether you are humming, whether you are singing words or just listening to the music. And I would say some of our greatest, um, some of our greatest activists have not been activists on the front lines. They have been folks like Marvin Gaye, who, have, who used his words to really help permeate and um, penetrate hearts and minds in the ways that folks thought. I, I always go back to folks like Maya Angelou, right? Like this idea of being able to talk about, I know why the cage bird sings, right? Like to be able to offer hope to folks in the midst of very trying set situations. And so I think that more singing, more poetry, more coming together in those spaces, um, we've done things I, uh, you know, recently was talking group, to a group of young people and looking at um, the, the videos from Kendrick Lamar and from um, Childish Gambino and Donald Glover and being able to be like, let's really unpack this. Like there's a video, This Is America from Donald Glover and like, let's sit and have a conversation. Having a conversation around Langston Hughes, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Does it fester like a sore and then run? Like having a conversation around that allows people to remove the personal pieces of it, to look at that art and to have an honest conversation that would, that leaves people to not be able to be afraid about offending each other. And so I think that it allows us to create some safe spaces to have something to focus on that decenters individuals and allows us to have honest, open conversations. So I think more poetry readings, more conversations, more sing-alongs, more singings, um, more karaoke is um, is very important. I feel like my years as a kindergarten teacher, what I did learn is that children's books and keeping it simple and being very basic is the easiest way to like get a message across. And if we can, you know, as Jesus said, be childlike, you know, if we could just allow ourselves to come as children um, without all the baggage that we've learned over the, the decades of our adult lives, I think we are more inclined to, um, to actually build social justice and get to a place of love. Absolutely beautifully said and so resonant with my understanding of the place that art plays in justice movements. I, I really don't have much to add to that. Um, the only thing I will say is, and, and you you hinted at this, Dr. Davis, but I just wanted to uplift it a little more, was that, you know, art, particularly spoken word and drumming and painting and rap music and uh, jazz and like that, is a way, a vehicle for us to make sure that the movement is accessible, right? Because not everyone has the capacity or the ability to read all of the books that we've all read. <laughs> not everyone ha not, not everyone can read, right? That's the story of the oppression. Um, not everyone has the time or is off work at 6 p.m. to join us here today to have this discussion. And so I think, to, for us to also just remember that art is a, a vehicle for us to, to democratize and decolonize the movement work, to make sure that it's accessible to, for, by the most impacted people. Thank you. Eric, do we have time for one last question? Yes, we do. Okay. So this is, this is, this one is, um, I, I was thinking about um, how when I arrived at Washington State University 20 plus years ago, um, 
And of course, I was one of 187 Black women on campus and one of fewer than 500 Black students on campus. And I went to go visit the student center and uh, the person who was giving me a tour or the Black Student Union, should I say, which was new for me because I went to an HBCU. So I'm like, what? there's a whole Black Student Union. Wow, okay. So go there and this person then proceeds to give me a tour of all the Black leaders and tell me who they are. Charles Drew, Martin Luther King, all the people. And I was thinking, wow, why would you be showing me this? And he said, quite frankly, a lot of people come and don't know who these people are. And I find myself in these spaces now with um, my, my younger um, students and teachers where I might make a reference and it falls like, who is that? What is that? I have no clue, you're old lady. So um, I was wondering for anybody who has never heard of Dr. Martin Luther King, what would be the one sentence you would give them like your elevator pitch of who this man is or what and his legacy? I'll start with you, um, Dr. You cut out, sorry. Did you call on me or Dr. Davis? You, Dr. Joshi. Okay. All right, I'm gonna try to give a, an elevator sp speech, but um, I'll go back to you know, what we were talking about referencing earlier is I would say, please don't sleep through the revolution, right? Like if you haven't heard of Dr. King, um, that's, you know, sleeping through the revolution. Um, the, you know, and if you've only heard of Dr. Because I think most folks have probably heard of Dr. King, but if you've only heard of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, I would invite them to explore the writings and the archive of the documented actions in the 2,500 speeches more fully. Um, and for those of us who consider ourselves already students of Dr. King, there's always more to discover, to learn, to understand, to more fully listen to the messages of love and nonviolence. And I, I definitely have to say to also branch out specifically to the women of the movement, like start with Coretta's book, if you haven't already read it, right? Because we now know that the women behind uh, the movement were key. They were the community organizers, they were narrative cultivators, they were strategy architects. And so if you haven't heard of Dr. King, please don't sleep on the revolution. <laughs> if you have, but it's only that I have a dream speech, investigate more fully. I mean, if you're a student of Dr. King, listen deeper and start to branch into the women of the movement. Dr. Davis? Yeah, I mean, I will build on that. It's interesting because I was also thinking um, about beyond Dr. King, right? Like, what does that look like? And, um, and likewise, I don't think it's going to be an elevator pitch. It might be a little bit more than folks may want. But I often ask people, you know, how familiar they are if they've heard of a man by the name of Benjamin Elijah Mays. And Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays was the head of Morehouse College when King went there when he was 15. And he was the head of Morehouse College for, I think, 40 years. He um, also helped to start um, the Atlanta Board of Education. He started doing all of this work around education. But what is most meaningful to me about Benjamin Elijah Mays is that the quotes that exist for him say things like, if it is born of man or woman to do, everybody basically is born to do something special and unique in this world. Uh, he has another uh, quote where he basically says, if you don't do it, right, like if you don't do the thing that you were born to do, the leverage the unique gift that you have, then nobody will do it and the world will miss out on it. And so there are all these phrases that he plants that I'm like, you know, if we get beyond, we have a whole curriculum on beyond the dream. If we get beyond the dream, then we will realize that somebody planted those seeds in Dr. King. Somebody gave him the tools and the hope and the, the audacity that was talked about earlier to believe that he could make a difference. And that I think we all need to have two things. We need to have the ability to plant that seed in somebody to believe that they can make a difference. 
And we need to have somebody plant a seed in us to believe that we can make a difference. And so the thing that Dr. King did is that he received and he believed when Benjamin Mays said that you are here to do something special, unique and powerful, and he did it. And then he basically deputized the rest of us to believe that we can change the world, that we can do a thing that's never been done before. And so when I think about um, Dr. King and anybody that doesn't know him or doesn't understand the legacy of him, I would just say like we are all entitled to be human, but understanding that our humanity calls us to be a help to other people uh, to make the world better. And that's what Dr. King did, that he was human. And so as we go on in time and people talk about the flaws and the, the this and the that and the humanity of a person, but that humanity and that, you know, um, there's a line in a John Legend song that says all the perfect imperfections, right? And so if we can hold on to the fact that we are perfectly imperfect, and that we can be okay with that and understand that even in our state of imperfection, we have the power, the ability to change the world. That's what I think Dr. King represents. That is powerful. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank our guest speakers, Dr. Holly Joshi from the Center for uh, Social, um, Glide Center for Social Justice, and Dr. Cheryl Davis from the Human Rights Commission. And I'd like to turn this over now to Eric Arguello to talk a little bit more about what he's going to be having coming up next. Thank you so much, Paula. Thank you, Dr. Joshi, Dr. Davis. Uh, it was truly a rich, engaging, and powerful conversation. Um, and I hope everyone can join us next month. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we are celebrating February 23rd, African American Heritage Month, and we'll be celebrating our African American youth. Also, please make sure you sign up uh, to become a justice warrior at glide.org under the Center for Social Justice page. And I guess for me, the phrase for tonight is please don't sleep through the revolution. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you.